So today it uh, it is uh, great, my great pleasure to uh, have uh, Hong Yang Gao uh, as our speaker. Hong Yang is going to be giving a talk on graph neural networks. So prior to uh, uh, coming at I, uh, coming to us, ISU, Hong Yang received his PhD degree from Texas A&M University uh, at College Station, Texas. Uh, his research interests include machine learning, deep learning, and data mining. Uh, before uh, his PhD, he received his master's degree from Tsinghua University and a bachelor's degree from Peking University um, in 2009. Uh, there will be some time for Q&A um, after the talk. I hope that many of you could stay. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I would like to welcome Hong Yang. Please go ahead and get started. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you very much for you to present this talk. So today I'm going to introduce my research on graph neural network, a feature and a structure learning approach. In the real world, a lot of data are naturally represented as graphs, such as social networks, biomedical networks, chemical compounds, and the citation networks. And these data are pervasive and closely related to us. On this graph data, there are various machine learning tasks like node classification, graph classification, link prediction, etc. So let's see some examples. Node classification problem aims to predict the label of each node in the graph. So let's take citation network as an example. In a citation network, each node is a publication. And the edges represent the references among the publications. So the node classification task on citation network wants to predict this publication belongs to computer science, math, or chemistry. Graph classification task would like to predict the label of the graph. So the applications include the drug property prediction and the malicious software uh, detection. So in this example, we are given some chemical structures and the first structure is toxic and the second one is non-toxic. So the problem is to determine if a new chemical structure is toxic or not. Many traditional machine learning methods have been applied to solve these problems, such as support vector machine, random forests, and logistic regression. However, these methods require heavy feature engineering. The quality of the features directly determine their performances. So however, it is very hard and time consuming to find the informative features sometimes. So the problem is, can we use some methods that can save the effort of feature engineering? Now with pervasive graph data and the various related tasks, uh, the question is, can we apply deep learning methods on graph data? Because graph deep learning can do some automatic feature engineering work. So first let's have a brief background about deep learning. So deep learning has been successful in various fields, such as computer vision and natural language processing. Many popular tasks in these fields are greatly advanced by deep learning, such as image, class, image classification in, in computer vision and machine translation in natural language processing. So when we took a look at the data in these fields, they are mostly grid-like data. So for example, in the field of computer vision, an image can be represented as a 2D grid. So we can use each pixel on the image as a node on the grid, and the adjacent pixels are connected by edges. And similarly, the text data can also be represented as a 1D grid. So we can use words or characters as a nodes in this grid. However, not all data can be converted into grids, such as graph data. So a strict question will be, does deep learning also works on graph data? So with this question, let's take a deeper look at the deep learning methods. So there are very many deep learning methods, such as convolution and pooling. These operations usually require locality information that are available on grid-like data. So the locality information here means the relative position information. So this small example shows how a 1D convolution uh, layer works. So in a convolution operation, a trainable kernel is employed to scan all possible positions on the input. So here the kernel is simply a small matrix of weights. 
it performs an element-wise multiplication then summation operation. So in this example, the kernel is W1, W2, and W3, and it scans all three possible positions and gives three outputs. So here I see some key properties for this uh, operation. This process can also be considered as an information aggregation process. So in the first position, node B is aggregating information from its neighbors with different weights. So here I want to mention three properties. The first, the number of the printable parameters equals the number of the neighbors. So the filter size here determines the number of the neighbors to get the information from. So the number of trainable parameters equals the number of neighbors. And since on grid-like data, each element can have a fixed number of neighbors, and we can train a fixed number of tra uh, trainable parameters in this operation. And second, input order matters. So in this operation, if we switch node A and node C, so the output will, ch will change. So this means the input order matters and there are relative position information among them. And also, mm -hmm. also both the input and the operation are not permutation invariant. So permutation invariant here means the output will remain the same no matter how you permutate your input. So obviously the operation is not permutation invariant. So if we switch node A and node C, it will become a different sequence and the, the output also change. But since the input is not permutation invariant, we do not require the operations on them to be permutation invariant. So now we want to know if these properties exist on graph data. Unfortunately, none of them exists. So let's check the first property. On grid-like data, each element has the same number of neighbors, but on graphs, nodes have different number of neighbors. So for example, in this small graph, node one has three neighbors, but node three has only one neighbor. So this means we cannot train a fixed number of parameters on graph data. And then let's move on to check the second property. On grid-like data, the neighbors have a locality or order information. They can assign weights to neighbors according to their positions. But on graphs, neighbors have no position information. So in this simple graph, node three and node four are the are neighbors of the node one, but we don't know how to order them because there's no order information or locality information for them. So literally we cannot determine how to assign the trainable weights to them. And finally, graph data is permutation invariant. On grid-like data, if we permutate the input data, they will become different data. But on graphs, if we permutate the nodes on the graph, it is still the same graph. So this means the methods defined on graph data should be permutation invariant. However, most existing deep learning methods are not permutation invariant. So now let's come back to this question. So can we apply the deep, existing deep learning methods on graph data? Obviously it is very challenging due to the distinct data structures between grid-like data and uh, graph data. So here we propose a novel feature and structure learning methods on graph data to solve these challenges. So before we start the method part, I will introduce some notations related to graphs. So in this presentation, I will mainly focus on the undirected and the attributed graph. But the methods covered can be easily extended to other types of graphs. So given an undirected attributed graph, we have n nodes in a graph, and each of them has C features. And then we use an adjacency matrix A to, rep uh, to represent the graph connectivity. And then we stack all node features to get this feature matrix X. So my research on graph neural network mainly include two parts, feature learning and structure learning. Feature learning is motivated that the machine learning task like classification often require the input to be uh, mathematically and computationally convenient to process. However, in the real world, the data such as images, vid videos, and the sensor data are usually complex, redundant, and highly variable. 
So it is very necessary to discover some useful features or representations from the raw data. And the traditional handcraft data are often require expensive human labor or rely on expert knowledge. And also, they do not generalize well. So this uh, motivates us to design some efficient feature learning technique to automatically generate uh, the features. And also, uh, and in feature learning, so in feature learning, we focus on how to learn a better feature representation, representation for each node. And here for each node, we, the function f, output is new features or embeddings. Literally, this function takes the adjacency matrix and the feature matrix as input, and the output and output a new feature matrix without changing the graph connectivity. And the popular feature learning methods include the graph convolution and the graph attention. In structure learning, we want to learn a new stru uh, graph structures. So the function in structure learning methods needs to output a new adjacency matrix and a new feature matrix. So for this part, we will introduce graph pooling and the graph unpooling. So this is this is an outline for today's presentation. I will first introduce my work on feature learning and the structure learning. Then I will I would like to share some of my ideas on the future works. So in feature learning, we want to learn better feature representations for each node. So to make it clear, I will explain this as a two-step process. So in the first step, the center node will first gather information or features from its neighbors. So then a feature transformation function is performed on aggregated features. So usually we employ a linear transformation for the second step. So the key challenge is how to effectively aggregate features from the neighborhood. The existing methods on feature learning mainly include two categories, so convolutional-like operation and attention-based operations. The, op the convolutional-like operations include the graph convolutional network and the graph stage. Literally, they learn the aggregation ways explicitly. And on the contrast, the attention-based operation like graph attention network learn the aggregation ways implicitly. The graph convolution uses a very strong, uh, straightforward method to do this. It leverages features from the neighborhood. So in this example, the center node one has three neighbors. It aggregates features by averaging them. So the mathematical exp expression for this part is inverse D multiply A, then multiply X. So D here is a degree matrix of the graph. And then it apply a linear transformation and get a new feature representation for the node one. But this method has a limitation. You can see it gives equal weights for the neighboring nodes. So this can limit the model capacity. So we may want to give different weights to different neighbors. So for example, when we asking advices from our friends, so we may, we may pay more, more attention to some friends because they are more experienced. So this can be a limitation for the graph convolutional network. To address this limitation, we propose a learnable graph convolution. So it can automatically learn different weights for features from different neighbors. This is a mathematical expression for this algorithm. So for each node, and each feature space, we rank the na uh, neighboring nodes and select the top k features out. Um, and then on these k selected and ranked features, we apply a feature-wise linear transformation. So next, I will use a small example to illustrate this algorithm. So in this example, node one has three neighbors and two features. In the first, first feature space, we rank the first feature and select the uh, six and four from the node one and node two and node four. And in the second feature space, so we select eight and four from node four and node three. So in this way, we can aggregate K by C features for the center node. And then we can apply a linear transformation to produce a new feature representation for this node. So this will give different weights or trainable weight, trainable parameters to the features when they do the weighted summation. And in this, in this way, 
they can address the limitation and assign trainable weights to different uh, neighbors. And in the previous methods, we mainly used original graph structure. So now we want to use additional or auxiliary graph structures, such as line graph. Line graph is created from a graph by using edges as the vertices in the new graph. So here is a small example. In the original graph, it has four nodes and four edges. And then we can construct a line graph like this. Here, each edge in the original, each edge in the original graph will become a node in the new graph. So then if, we, if two edges share a same ending node, so we, can, we will add an edge between them. With this land graph structure, so we can run graph neural network on both graph structures. And by performing, by performing message passing on the auxiliary graph structure, it can enhance the feature learning on graphs. But using land graph has a limitation. That is, the node features are biased in land graph. The bias in land graph is due to its way of construction. So in a graph, a node with degree d will generate d by d minus one over two edges in the line graph. So for, for a node with degree d, it will have d edges in the original graph, but have d times d minus one over two edges in the line graph. And when they do the message passing, so the, the passing frequency of, the, of this node's data will be uh, will be O D square in the line graph. So this means uh, the data of the data pa passed in the line graph will be overestimated. So node features will be overestimated in the line graph. And to correct this bias, we propose a weighted line graph by assigning different weights to the edges. So here is a formula to compute the weights. So in the first case. So if A not equal C, so that means the two, uh, two edits just, just share a single ending node. And we will assign the weights one over the degree of node B to this edge. And uh, in, the second case, in the second case, it considers a self loop because we have self loops in the graph. In this case, the two edits will share two ending nodes. So the weights will be uh, one over the degree of B plus one over the degree of A. So in this way, we can correct the bias in the line graph. So here is a small example. So the first figure is a original graph and the second figure is a regular line graph with self loops. So here each edge has a weight of one and the last figure shows a weighted line graph constructing, constructed uh, by using our, uh, the, this formula. So for example, the edge AB and the edge between AB and AD share the same ending node A. So its, it's, it's weight is assigned one over three because the uh, uh, degree of the node A is three. And for self loops like um, AB to AB, so it is assigned one over three plus one over one. So because the degrees of node A is uh, three and the degree of node B is one. So with our weighted line graph structure, we can run the graph neural networks on both graph structure. And then by performing the message passing on auxiliary graph structure, it can enhance the uh, feature learning on graphs. So to evaluate our feature learning methods, we use the uh, node classification and the graph classification tasks. So here are the results on node classification tasks. We use three data sets, Cora, Satir, and Palm. So they are all citation networks. Each node represents a publication and the edges are references among the publications. So here we report the accuracies of the networks, uh, networks on these data sets. From the, the results, we can see our proposed method Learnable graph convolution can uh, achieve the better performance than the previous uh, state-of-the-art models. And here are the results on graph classification tasks. So we evaluate our methods on six data sets, six data sets, and which cover a big range in terms of the number of graphs and the average number of nodes in the graph. 
So here, the mutex, PTC, and DND, and proteins are bioinformatic datasets. And the IMDB and the CoLab are social networks. From the results, we can see our weighted line graph convolution outperform our other methods on all six datasets. So here we conduct a, a performance studies on hyperparameter selection in our methods. So in our learnable graph convolution, each node will select the key features to aggregate in, the, uh, in each feature dimension. So from the result here, we conduct, uh, we change the number of K in the, in the ex, uh, experiments and reports the results in this figure. So from, the, from this figure, the best performance are achieved when K equals eight. So this means we use, when we use K equals eight, the best performance are achieved. So a heuristic in practice to select the hyperparameter K is that we can use the average node degree to select the K in this method. And the previous methods mainly focus on how to learn a new feature representations based on the existing data structure. So however, in the real world, data come in big sizes. So a graph like social network can be very big. So sometimes we need structured learning methods to learn a, a, to learn a smaller graph and to save the computational resources. And this means we need to do structured learning. The structured learning methods will output a new adjacency matrix and a new feature matrix. So for structured learning, we will introduce a graph pooling and a graph unpooling. Graph pooling will reduce the number of nodes in the graph, which results in a cause in the graph. So it is very similar to a classic task, graph causing. And on the contrast, graph unpooling aims to restore the original graph structure. Typically, it will increase the number of nodes in the graph, so, but it helps to build an a encoder-decoder network. So let's first look at the graph pooling. An existing structure learning method is cluster-based pooling methods. It reduces the size of the graph by, cluster, by clustering some similar nodes to some to super nodes or clusters. So then it uses the clusters as a nodes in the new graph. So a uh, limitation of the, this graph is, is this method is that it needs cluster information for the training. So when during the training, they will need the cluster information for, uh, to provide some raw signals. But in the most graph data set, we do not have such kind of information. Then to do graph pooling, we propose an importance-based node selection method. So this has been um, uh, this has been a main research stream in the, uh, of graph pooling in the community. This method mainly contains two steps. Two steps. In the first step, we will generate ranking scores for each node. Then based on the ranking scores, we select the most important nodes to form the new graph. So we can see that. How to generate informative ranking scores is the most important part in this method. Then in our proposed graph pooling layer, we use projection values as a ranking scores. So by, rise, by using a trainable vector P, we project each node features to this vector. And the projection values are used as their ranking scores. And then we rank them based on this score and select the K nodes out to form the new a uh, new graph. So here we, we uh, store the indices of the select nodes in IDX, and then we extract a new feature matrix and the new adjacency matrix. Next, I will use a small example to explain this algorithm. So given a graph, we use a trainable vector P. Then we project each node features on this vector P and get their projection values. So here we use dot product to, to, retrain, to retain the differences in both angle and magnitude. And then these projection values are used as a ranking scores for these nodes. And finally, we choose three nodes with highest ranking scores and extract a new feature matrix and a new adjacency matrix. Here we can see the ranking scores of each node uh, is generated, generated by projecting those features to this trainable vector P. And uh, 
Same, uh, at the same time, the resulting constant graph retains parts of the nodes and edges from the original graph. But from this example, we can also see a limitation in our graph pooling layer. When generating the ranking scores, it doesn't consider the graph topology information. The scores are completely based on the node features without using any graph connected information in the graph. So a possible consequence is that the selected nodes may be isolated with each other. So the constant graph may, may contain, only contain several isolated nodes and completely lost original graph structure. So to address this uh, limitation, we move forward to propose a topology of their pooling layer. In this method, we use a attention mechanism to generate the ranking scores. The ranking score of each node is based on its average similarity scores with its neighbors. So this is a mathematical expression of the, our topology of our pooling layer. So here, x times x transpose will compute the similarity scores for each pair of connected nodes. And then each node will average its similarity scores from, with the neighbors and use the results as its ranking score. So based on this ranking score, the k nodes are selected and the new feature matrix and the new adjacency matrix are, ex are extracted. So here is a small example. So on this graph, we first compute the similarity scores for each pair of connected nodes. And the similarity scores between node i and the node j is computed, computed by their features a dot product. And then we compute the ranking score by averaging their related similarity scores. So for example, the score of the green node is, um, is 0.45. So, um, and uh, actually it is an average of 0.37 uh, and uh, uh, it's 0 of, uh, 0.29 and the 0.52. So the ranking score for this green node is 0.45. And now each node has its ranking scores. Based on the ranking score, we select the top K nodes and the new graph is generated by extracting new feature matrix and the new adjacency matrix. So in this way, we can see the ranking scores now contain the graph structure information. And this can address the limitation in the graph pooling layer. So previously we discussed how to do graph pooling uh, then now we move on to talk about uh, the graph unpooling. Graph unpooling operations aims to restore the original graph structure. So this is very useful for building some encoder-decoder networks. So to this end, we propose a graph unpooling layer. And uh, here we want to restore the original graph structure. So we can, we, we can use the structure information from the corresponding pooling layer. So in, in the left part, we use a graph pooling layer to produce a constant graph. So in this uh, process, we will record the position information of the nodes, especially for those unselected nodes. Then we, we may apply some convolutional operations on the constant graph. And in the red part, the graph unpooling layer wants to restore the original graph structure. Then it, then it can refer to the previous recorded graph position information and restore the original graph. So in this way, it can perform the um, unpooling operation on graphs. Based on our graph pooling and the graph unpooling method, we can build a encoder-decoder network. Encoder-decoder network architecture is very popular and effective. It has been widely used in biomedical image segmentation and autoencoders. So our graph UNET also uses the encoder-decoder uh, architecture. The left part is the encoder part. It uses pooling to generate calls in the graphs and encode some high-level features. And in the red part, uh, it is a decoder part. It gradually restores the original graph structure to, uh, by using the position information from corresponding pooling layers. And then the network will finally output the network, network embedding of feature representations for each node. So here we use a node classification and the graph classification task, tasks to evaluate our structure learning methods. 
So these are the results on node classification tasks. Our proposed methods graph pooling uh, achieve the be better performance than the previous methods. And these are the results on graph classification tasks. So both the graph pooling and the topology of where pooling achieve the uh, competitive performance uh, compared to the previous uh, methods. So at the same time, since that our topology of where pooling layer considers the topology information, so you can see it is significantly outperformed the previous methods on these data sets. So here we uh, want to compare our graph pooling and the topology of where pooling by visualizing the, the uh, graph structures of their outputs. So given an input graph, both pooling layer will select six nodes to form a new graph. From the output, we can clearly see that the, uh, the output graph of the topology of where pooling has a better connectivity and retain more original graph structures. So this also explains why the topology of where pooling have much better performance than the graph pooling layer. And besides the research work on graph neural network, I also have some research work on other research topics. So we propose some uh, general deep learning methods, uh, pixel, like pixel transpose convolution, invariant convolution, and adaptive convolution, and to matrix. So they address some uh, general challenges in existing deep learning methods. And besides effectiveness, we also pay attention to the efficiency of the deep learning methods. So currently, most deep learning methods are very heavy in terms of the number of trainable parameters and also the computational cost. So our proposed uh, channel nets, Kronecker attention networks, and the Siamese attention networks can significantly reduce the usage of computational resources. So previous research work on graph neural network mainly focused on the effectiveness of models. But on graphs, scalability is a very critical issue. So the fact is that a graph can be very large. In some social networks, there are maybe about 2.5 billion activity users. So this means we may have a graph with 2 billion nodes, and it is impossible to run as existing graph neural networks on such kind of giant graphs. So scalability is the next challenge we need to address on graph neural networks. So to address this problem, we mainly have two directions. The first direction is to compress our model. And uh, we want to make our graph neural network as small as possible such that it can process larger graphs. So this can somehow relieve the problem, but not resolve it, but, but cannot resolve this problem. So we, we, we still need to face a giant graph. So second, second direction would be the subgraph chain. So when facing a large graph, we can partition this graph into some small subgraphs, and then we feed this uh, subgraph into a new graph neural network for training and testing. So in this way, we can process arbitrary large graphs in parallel and make the predictions. So you can see that this method can solve the problem fundamentally. But the challenging part is that how to effectively partition the graph. So when we use a subgraph uh, for training and testing, we want them to contain enough information such that the, our graph convolutional networks can work as uh, can work as usual. And this is a very challenging part in, for this future work. And another future work will be the interpretation of the graph neural networks. So in some scenarios, we want to know why and how our model is making certain predictions. So the performance alone is not enough. Since our model is trained on limited data, so it cannot deal with all possible situations as expected. So there must be some situation, situations that it can never be seen during the training process. And then in some extreme situations, they can make totally wrong decisions. So this is not accept acceptable, especially in some critical applications like self-driving. So a single wrong decision will, will result in severe losses. So we want to know why our model is making such kind of predictions and uh, we can help them to avoid the mistake in some scenarios. And this, finally, thank you very much for listening and I will be very happy to take questions.
Thank you very much, Hong Yang, for this talk. Um, appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, um, uh, could you uh, could you please either um, type them on the chat or use the microphone uh, to uh, to ask them? Uh, we can uh, we can take the uh, questions on a first come first serve basis. Uh, can I, can I ask a question for the to start? Sure, young one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Since yeah. you have the microphone. So, yeah. So I just use the microphone. So um, uh, thanks for the for the talk, uh, Hong Yan. And I try to understand because I'm coming from a statistics background. I I work on some of these graphics, uh, many uh, estimating the the networks. Uh, but uh, it seems that what you are doing is very different. I, I try to just get an idea of exactly what you are trying to do using your algorithm. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you just uh, maybe walk through the, the citation network example? What okay. is the data you got? What, what is the thing you're trying to learn? What is the feature, more specifics? So that uh, we understand what you invented the uh, algorithm is, is, uh, is helping. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I will. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, let's take um, statistical network as example. So in each, uh, in this network, each node is a publication, and all, we use uh, references among them as edits. Actually, the initial features um, we usually use bag of words to generate the features for each publication. So, for example, if uh, if uh, a word uh, like graph appears in this um, in this publication, then we can have a uh, we can label uh, label it as one in the in the position of, in the position in the in the vector. So back of words usually initialize uh, have a vector of size of the uh, with the size of the dictionary. So for example, if you have <coughs> you have a dictionary and it has four four thousand words, and then if you can uh, you can uh, have a index for each word in this vector. And then if these words appear in the in this publication, and then you have one in this uh, in this position. So this is a bag of words. So in this way, we can you can uh, generate a feature uh, a feature vector for each node in the for each publication in this network. And you can see uh, the initial feature is very sparse because it has a lot of zeros and only some ones, and also it has no semantic information. So uh, so in, in this way, we, uh, we want to learn a uh, low dimensional feature representations for this publication. So for example, uh, in, maybe initial, the initial feature vector is 4,000 uh, 4, features in, uh, because we, we use a dictionary of cells that says 4,000. And then we want to learn maybe a small feature vector just like 20, 20 features. So in this way, we learn some continuous features and also this, is, this size is also very small. It can contain some semantic inf information. So, it's in, so by using our graph neural, uh, neural networks, we can learn some more useful features. And these features can be used for some downstream tasks, like you can do the publication classification, and also you can do some link prediction for uh, recommendation, something like this. So I'm not sure is that clear. So, so basically, your data is uh, is uh, these papers and uh, converted into a feature vector, like a four thousand long vector at each of these network. Right, right. You try to use the network structure to help you select the, to reduce the dimension of the feature. Right, right. To support subset. Yeah, yeah. You can you can generate a, a low dimensional feature representation, and the, also this uh, low dimensional feature representation also have some semantic information. Um, so how 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 do you actually do that? I, I don't quite get the, the pooling and all those kind of thing. How was that? Uh, uh let me see. Um, in, in the next uh, a couple of slides, you you show some of the features using numbers, right? One. Right. Right. And, uh, uh, and then. Uh, yeah. So I, this is one and two. These are two demand, two different features. Yeah. For example, the, the here for each node we have two uh, two features, right? So uh, if you use back of words, you, can, you may have maybe uh, this vector to be four thousand features, 
uh, uh, 4,000 features. So for each node, you have 4,000 features, and then you can generate a feature matrix by, stack, by stacking all the, all the features in the feature uh, matrix X, and then you can use uh, uh, mass, uh, the formula to compute. So I I wanted to get to perhaps other questions um, and if uh, if Yang Wan and and um, and Hong Yang if you uh, maybe do the other question uh, follow up on this after the uh, okay. after that may be good. So there uh, there is a question from Aditya who asks in the graph learning setup do you have any hyperparameters that you need to search over? If yes, how many? And is there a systematic way of doing it? Oh yeah yeah. Uh, yes, actually, there are many uh, hyperparameters, like how many uh, convolutional layers you use, and the learning rate, and the uh, the choice of the optimizer. So actually, uh, currently, we in our experiments, we do not have a, a systematic way to do that. But uh, in the in this research field, there is a automatic uh, how to say it's a NAIs. It's actually is a kind of um, hyperparameter search. So it's a, they are, uh, it's a hot research area and they do the, hyper, uh, the, they do the uh, hyperparameter search in, in the space and this can give, give you some, automatically give you some uh, good, good settings for these uh, hyperparameters. And uh, I, I, will, I will do the next one. Thank you, yep, go ahead. Uh, so the next question is from Jason who asks, how do these methods work when edges also have art attributes? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, in in this presentation, I mainly focus on focus on the node features. But if you have edge features, there are uh, mainly two ways to do that. So the first one is that you can propagate the edge features to the node features. So for example, you have for each edge, it have it will have two ending nodes. And you can concatenate the node features to the uh, to the two and uh, to the node features of the two ending node, and this is the first way. And uh, uh, another way is that we can use the line graph. So, oh, I think I talked about it. Okay. So we can see we can use line graphs because in the original uh, graph. Uh, the edges are uh, not uh, well represented, but in the line graph, we can see each edge will become a node in the line graph, and then you can use uh, use these edges, uh, edge feature, edge features as uh, new node features in this line graph, and you can do the, you can uh, apply the graph neural network and uh, get get predictions. Thank you. So the next question is by Shatang Shatang Dai. Um, he asked, what do you um, want uh, uh, to select nodes similar to their uh, neighbors instead of central nodes? Yeah, actually here is an example because I, uh, in this step, I use node one as a center node. Actually, uh, this process will repeat for every node in the graph. So this, this means um, I will use node one as a center, uh, as a cen a central a node and produce a new feature representation for this node. And then I will, I will use node four as a center node and also generate a new feature representation for the node four. So this process will repeat for all the nodes in the graph. So next we have uh, Drew Zhang who says he has a couple of questions to follow. Um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead and can you just use your mic microphone please? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, th so th thank you, Hongyang, for a very, uh, for a wonderful talk. So I, I have several questions, if you don't mind. The first question is a, uh, is maybe because I was late five minutes, I didn't get that part. So in both studies, you talked about graph classification. Yeah. So I was just curious how you computed the graph embeddings from the node embeddings. Did you do some sort of simple pooling oh, yeah. or, yeah. or tension? Oh, okay. Uh, actually, I, I didn't include this part in the in the. In my presentation, so actually we usually do a readout function. So actually, it's a kind of global global function. So for example, we, we can use a global max or global average or even global summation. So currently, the global summation works uh, best. So we we mostly use a global uh, summation because so sum up sum up all the all the node embeddings. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Then the other question is about the graph pooling layer. I, I, I wasn't sure whether I completely understood it. So that's something you propose mm -hmm. as part of a architecture, right? First of all, You're right. so that's something that do you, are you proposing it something that happens before the embedding operation or, or, uh, actually, this is, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, so you, you can go ahead. <laughs> I mean, if it just if, if you position this layer in the in a deep network, is it going to be before the embedding layer or after the embedding layer? Yeah, uh, actually, in the regular CNN convolution network, so we uh -huh. have convolution, convolution, then pooling, then convolution, convolution, pooling. So uh, this uh, so this graph pooling layer can be also used uh, uh, like this. So, oh. okay. so in the same way as you do in the image convolution kind right, of setting. Right, right, right. Uh, actually, it can uh, it, it can uh, enlarge the recept receptive field, and also you can re um, remove some uh, feature redundancies. Of, okay. um, yeah. So it's it's so you're learning some tasks spe specific pulling operations. Uh, you can see that yeah, because I uh, I'm retaining some edits original uh, edits from the graph yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, then the third question, last one, is on the encoder decoder architecture you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, was it something, is it, I mean, is this some sort of reconstruction scenario or, or do you have something more than just a reconstruction? Uh, actually, it, it depends on the, the task. So for example, if you want to, uh, if the task is reconstruction, for example, you input a graph and then you want to learn a, a graph and the exactly the same graph, then we'll do the reconstruction. And th this scenario is usually used in the compression. Okay. So, so for example, in the in the bottom part, you can use the bottom part as a compression result of the, this graph, and then you use the red part to restore the original graph. This can be used as a uh, compression for the to reduce the uh, uh, no load of the uh, maybe trans transmission or something like this. But if you want to do some, uh, for example, just a node classification, and this may not be the reconstruction. It can learn some high-level features, and also it, we can see these um, black arrows. They are skip connections. So this can also consider the, um, the low-level features. So this is a, a unit architecture. The benefit of the unit architecture. So, so you're going to use the bottleneck representations as for 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 classification? Yeah, it depends. Actually, you can use the output. You can also you can use the final output for the classification, and you can also use the bottom part as a classification. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The next question is by Jaji Li, uh, who asks, could you explain the meaning of the numbers in the node, for example, the 9-2 at node 11? Um, node 1, sorry. Uh, okay. uh, I think it's, uh, it's a kind of just a illustration. Okay. Let me see. Uh, okay. So for example, in the, the center node one has nine and two, so it's, it's just a kind of features. But if you consider each node is a person, and the first feature space is how many uh, books do you have? So for example, you have nine, then you just place nine here. And the second one may be how many keyboards do you have? So you place two here. So it's a kind of illustration. Uh, Bruce, uh, so the, uh, the next question is by uh, is a second follow up by Jason, which is, is your source code available? Oh yeah, yeah, they are, they are available. You can access my GitHub. Okay. Well, thank you again. I think um, the we have no more questions. Um, thank you everybody for attending, and thank you Hang Yang for uh, for this excellent presentation. Um, have a good rest of the Thursday, Friday, and the and the weekend. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Bye bye now.